In 1973, 250 Sioux Native Americans, as part of a grassroots organization named the American Indian Movement, or AIM, occupied the town of Wounded Knee, located in the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. This 71-day occupation protested the US government's continued failure to honor its treaties and accused tribal chairman Richard Wilson of corruption. This was a grassroots reclamation of the town, which drew non-Sioux natives from across the US to join the protest in solidarity. Protesters chose the town of Wounded Knee, the site of the massacre of 300 Sioux by the US Army in 1890, for its symbolism, its statement that the violence faced by Native Americans nearly 83 years earlier had not gone away. The US government under then-President Richard Nixon responded with armed soldiers and aircraft, killing two and wounding 13, then arresting 1,200 native protesters. That same year, Marlon Brando refused to accept an Oscar for Best Actor. As you've just watched, Sachin Littlefeather stepped up to the stage to reject the award on his behalf. Only permitted to speak for 60 seconds, she explained that Brando refused to accept the award on account of events at Wounded Knee and the treatment of Native Americans by the film industry and television. In saying this, Littlefeather implied that the treatment of natives by the film industry, implicitly racist depictions of natives in the text themselves, and the exclusion and abuse of natives from the industry, was directly connected to the violence that natives were facing at the hands of the US government at Wounded Knee and beyond. The film industry, she said with utmost patience and bravery on one of the largest and most prestigious stages in the world, was directly complicit in ongoing violence against Native Americans. Sachin's words still hold power today, in 2021, because they are still true. And in 2021, they are not only true of film and television, but of a medium which has experienced a rapid and unprecedented rise since the 1973 Academy Awards. Of course, we're talking about video games. In this video essay, we'll be asking the question implied in Littlefeather's brief appearance at the Oscars, but with regards to the video game industry. How is the video game industry complicit in the systemic racism and violence faced by Native Americans? How is it, in other words, complicit in settler colonialism? Hi, I'm Daz, pronouns they, them. And I'm Sara, pronouns she, they. Welcome to Game Assist. We're back with our first video essay in a few months, so we hope it's plenty juicy enough to have been worth the wait. It's certainly a long one, so get comfortable and maybe bring some snacks. Before we dive in, if you aren't a patron already and you'd like to help us do what we do, please consider pledging your support at patreon.com slash gameassistyt, and remember to hit those like and subscribe buttons. We've tried to keep spoilers to a minimum, but nevertheless, this essay will contain varying degrees of spoilers for the following games. Horizon Zero Dawn, Beyond Two Souls, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, Genshin Impact, Life is Strange, Assassin's Creed 3. The topic of this essay is settler colonialism, mostly in the context of the US or the metaphorical context of fantasy worlds, but sometimes internationally as well. Please do be aware of the following content which may be triggering. Use of the word Indian to describe Native Americans where it is a direct quote. Discussions and depictions of anti-indigenous racism and violence. Mention of sexual assault as a weapon of war. As we usually do with our video essays, we've put together a collection of key concepts and definitions to help you get a basic understanding of the context before we begin our analysis. Central to the particular racism and oppression that indigenous people face is a system called settler colonialism, so understanding this is absolutely vital to our arguments. To understand settler colonialism, we first need to examine the difference between it and other forms of colonialism, as well as the different roles present in the settler colonial context. We have based the structure of this essay and its title on a 2012 paper by Eve Tuck and K. Wayne Yang, titled, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. In this paper, Tuck and Yang lay out what settler colonialism is, how it differs from other forms of colonialism, and how settlers use subtle ways to position themselves away from colonial violence. These are called Settler Moves to Innocence, and we have used various video games to exemplify each of these moves. 
When you think of colonialism, you are likely thinking of one of two types, internal colonialism and external colonialism. Tuck and Yang define internal colonialism as the biopolitical and geopolitical management of people, land, flora and fauna within the domestic borders of the imperial nation. This involves the use of particularised modes of control – prisons, ghettos, minoritising, schooling, policing – to ensure the ascendancy of a nation and its white elite. This can be used to describe the oppression of people of colour in the US or of the Uyghur people in China. China's history of controlling its 55 minority ethnic groups includes tactics such as enforcing the use of Mandarin as the language of teaching in schools over local native languages, and more recently the internment of the Uyghur people in so-called re-education camps. In these examples, the colonizer, so the US or China, is controlling its own racialized populations, people of color, Uyghur, within the confines of the nation. External colonialism, on the other hand, is described as the expropriation of fragments of indigenous worlds, animals, plants, and human beings, extracting them in order to transport them to, and build the wealth, the privilege, or feed the appetites of, the colonizers. In external colonialism, all things native become recast as natural resources, bodies and earth for war, bodies and earth for chattel. This could describe, for example, the extraction and selling of oil from the Middle East by the UK and US that resulted in the formation of war fronts, or the transporting of chattel slaves to America in the 1800s. In contrast to internal colonialism, in both of these examples, indigenous bodies and earth outside of the colonial centre are being exploited. Oil is taken from the Middle East, outside of the US and the UK, for the benefit of the US and the UK. So what is settler colonialism? Settler colonialism operates through internal and external colonial modes simultaneously because there is no spatial separation between metropole and colony. The horizons of the settler colonial nation-state are total and require a mode of total appropriation of indigenous life and land, rather than the selective expropriation of profit-inducing fragments. Settler colonialism hinges on the total displacement of and or destruction of indigenous people and land to make room for slash be replaced by a population of settlers. While these other forms of colonialism seek to uphold the power of the dominant elite and generate profit from stolen resources, they do not necessarily require this complete removal of indigenous land and life, because there is no need to make way for settlers. Two of the clearest examples of settler colonial nations in the modern day are the US, where European settlers began to occupy the land in the 16th and 17th centuries, and the State of Israel's occupation of Palestine. Both of these settler colonial nation states aim to wipe out the indigenous populations whose land they have stolen and continue to steal and turn into property. Within settler colonialism, land is what is most valuable, contested, required. This is both because the settlers make indigenous land their new home and source of capital, and also because the disruption of indigenous relationships to land represents a profound epistemic, ontological, cosmological violence. In the process of settler colonialism, land is remade into property, and human relationships to land are restricted to the relationship of the owner to his property. The two positions that one can occupy in a settler colonial nation-state are the settler or the indigenous. The Cambridge English Dictionary defines indigenous as something or someone that is naturally existing in a place or country rather than arriving from another place. Settler is then defined as a person who arrives, especially from another country, in a new place in order to live there and use the land. As we will come to see, settlers are often white and indigenous people are often racialized as non-white. However, this does not mean that people of colour cannot be settlers. In the United States, dispossessed people are brought onto seized indigenous land through other colonial projects. Therefore, settlers are diverse, not just of white European descent, and include people of colour even from other colonial contexts. Settler colonialism and its decolonization implicates and unsettles everyone. As Daz mentioned, Tuck and Yang's essay, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, provides the central framework for our own video essay, as we've reflected in the title. But what does it mean to say that decolonization is not a metaphor? Why does it need to be said in the first place? 
Tuck and Yang open their essay with a discussion that essentially focuses on the education system and on academic research. They explain that there are many in education who claim to be doing the work of decolonizing the mind, work like decentering subtler perspectives in the curriculum, for example. This work, while definitely important, often neglects to address the material reality of indigenous people, their struggle for sovereignty and repatriation. Often, it doesn't even address indigenous frameworks of knowledge or uplift indigenous people themselves. Decolonizing discourse in education essentially makes decolonization a metaphor, something to be discussed abstractly in the classroom, rather than something with real material significance that would overhaul the world we live in. Ultimately, this is in the settler's self-interest, as this metaphorization of decolonization makes possible a set of evasions, or settler moves to innocence, that problematically attempt to reconcile settler guilt and complicity and rescue settler futurity. By making decolonization a metaphor, settlers reconcile our their own guilt, and we they can also avoid doing the work that would require surrendering our their own power and claim to knowledge. I am inspired by Tuck and Yang's own use of we slash they when I refer to settlers here in order to show that I am grappling with my own complicated position as a person of colour displaced by colonisation and as a person with their own complicity in settler colonialism, especially as I lived in Canada on stolen land for some of my high school years. Tuck and Yang are interested in the idea of incommensurability, or the idea that some things don't fit together, they're difficult to address, and they exist in tension. Settler academics and educators, they say, should not feel comfortable. They shouldn't feel like their interests are reconcilable with indigenous people's interests. They should always feel uncomfortable and face their own complicity in settler colonialism head on. In Tuck and Yang's words, Actually, we argue, attending to what is irreconcilable within settler colonial relations and what is incommensurable between decolonizing projects and other social justice projects will help to reduce the frustration of attempts at solidarity. But the attention won't get anyone off the hook from the hard, unsettling work of decolonization. They conclude that instead of falling into the trap of focusing solely on the work of decolonizing the mind, thus getting too comfortable and making themselves ourselves innocent, settlers must remember that decolonization brings about the repatriation of indigenous land and life. It is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies and schools. Genuine solidarity with indigenous people under settler colonialism means actively supporting and acting in solidarity with efforts for repatriation. That is, returning land and everything that was stolen from indigenous people back to where it rightfully belongs, even, and especially, if this means surrendering settler comfort, power, and property. As alluded to throughout the essay Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, Settler fear of repatriation has a lot to do with, essentially, a lack of imagination. Many settlers are simply unable to imagine a relationship with land and life that isn't defined by property or ownership under capitalism, but various indigenous knowledge systems have centred the idea that land and life cannot be owned, in a capitalist sense, by anyone. Tuck and Yang conclude, Abolition is twofold, requiring the repatriation of land and the abolition of property, land and bodies. Abolition means self-possession, but not object possession. Repatriation, but not reparation. Dr. Carlos Hoyt offers the following definition of racialization. The definition I'm going to give, um, and I want to give attribution where, where, where it belongs, is one that comes from a, a province of Ontario report on the criminal justice system there, back in the 80s, I believe. And the way the process works is that we, and again, this has something to do with our cognitive architecture, very easily divide. And in the case of race, it's picking a superficial uh, feature of someone and saying, you folks who have this feature over here, and in the case of race, it's phenotype and uh, structure of uh, craniofacial structure, 
Uh, it is also ancestry. The second step is sorting, so that's separating them. Um, not just psychologically, but physically, you know, which actually we do uh, in the world. There's segregation, as we, know, as we know, based on race. Then we start to attribute you know, qualities to these groups based on anecdote, based on prejudice, based on what's convenient for us. I've noticed that you people over there with the brown skin you know, seem not as intelligent as the other people. And then in the original formulation uh, from the folks from the province of Ontario, the last is acting on those things and treating people differentially and discriminating based on those attributes. The missing element of that um, process, it seems to me, regarding race is essentialization. That the differences we attribute to folks, we say are permanent. You know, unlike civilizations and societies before roughly the 1500s, 1600s, going into the 1700s, there's no way to change the difference. For example, the Greeks would consider uh, folks who were outside of their culture to be barbarians, you know, folks who couldn't speak the language, uh, who didn't adopt the culture. But if folks decided to adapt those very essential attributes of the culture, they could be Greek, you know. Uh, but with race, the answer was no. You are inherently, irretrievably, <laughs> permanently different. As this definition implies, biology is inherent to the construction of race. Race is a socially constructed phenomenon, but we are led to believe that it is biologically, permanently, and naturally real. This is intended to make us believe that racial inequality is inevitable, because it's in our DNA. If biology is responsible, then people aren't responsible, and it can't be changed. This essentialist biological way of thinking about race, which rose with Darwinism and modern science, is essential to our current way of thinking about race. For further reading on this, I'd really recommend Angela Saini's book, Superior, The Return of Race Science, which you can order online at our bookshop storefront in order to support independent bookstores and support us at Game Assist. We also talked a bit about medicalization and biological essentialism in our video on women, writing, and madness in Tell Me Why, where I argued that mental illness is a socially constructed category, but one that we are led to believe is genetically, biologically, and pathologically true, so that we don't do anything to address the social, economic, and political factors that cause mental illness or disable people with mental impairments. Do check that video out too if you're interested. But back to race. Ethnicity and nationality are technically different from race, but people commonly think of the three interchangeably. Unhelpfully, some definitions actually do describe them as interchangeable. For example, Cambridge Dictionary Online contributes to the confusion by defining ethnicity as a large group of people who have the same national, racial, or cultural origins, or the state of belonging to such a group. In fact, an ethnic group is better defined as a group of people who identify with each other based on cultural attributes such as language, history, or tradition. For example, I, Sara, have British nationality. Ethnically, and this is usually what I tick on those government forms, I could be described as British Asian, because I have a lot in common with those of the Asian diaspora who live in Britain in terms of culture, history, and language. Racially, if we were to consider my recent ancestry or even my skin colour, hair type, and facial features, I could be classed as South Asian, or Desi, a term which many South Asians use to describe ourselves, meaning from the homeland. But even as I wrote this, even as I read this out loud, everything I've just said is extremely arbitrary and reductive. I really don't fit neatly into any of those categories, nor would I wish to, honestly. I could pose a million questions and make each categorization fall apart. For example, what does it mean that I was born in Saudi Arabia? That I'm Muslim? Or that to reach further into my ancestry, as with all humans, would reveal vast histories of migration from everywhere and anywhere in the world? Clearly all three forms of categorization, race, ethnicity, and nationality, are constructed. Nations probably the most obviously of all, when you stop to think about how silly it is to draw lines across the earth. People don't actually fit neatly into categories of any kind, but if white supremacy is to work, then we have to be able to categorize people somehow as white and non-white, settler and native, superior and inferior. 
Hence, racialization, or the process of constructing race and racially categorizing people, is an essential process that allows white supremacy to function, but understanding it more and more can help us dismantle it. As we'll discuss, racialization and race science shape the continued oppression of natives and their depiction in games. In Tuck and Yang's essay, they describe what they call settler moves to innocence. In their words, settler moves to innocence are those strategies or positionings that attempt to relieve the settler of feelings of guilt or responsibility without giving up land or power or privilege, without having to change much at all. In fact, settler scholars may gain professional kudos or a boost in their reputations for being so sensitive or self-aware. Yet settler moves to innocence are hollow, they only serve the settler. There are, of course, a dearth of video games which use two-dimensional and dehumanizing portrayals of indigenous people, including Native Americans. In our analysis, however, we will be using this framework of settler moves to innocence to take a look at some of the more normalized, seemingly harmless, but actually very insidious messages that video games have to tell us about settler colonialism and indigenous people. This will include discussions of the overwhelming trend to metaphorize indigenous people through the fantasy genre, but we'll also look at some of the very few examples of Native American representation there are in mainstream games. We'll also take a look at the material complicity of the industry in settler colonialism in a couple of global contexts. Importantly, while this essay is analyzing mainstream games, trends, and the industry, we're very aware that there are native developers out there working on their own amazing independent projects. We'll list some indie games by Native Americans you can check out in the description of this video, and if you have any recommendations of such games, please, please let us know in the comments or on social media, as we would love to play them and support them. Released in 2017, Horizon Zero Dawn was developed by Guerrilla Games, a Dutch studio owned by Sony Interactive Entertainment. The game is set in a post-apocalyptic future, a thousand years after the world was destroyed by military robots that lost control. These self-replicating machines consumed biomass as fuel, so they literally stripped the planet of all life. A project known as Zero Dawn worked to shut down the robots, create a new terraforming system so that life on Earth could begin anew, and preserve as much human knowledge and culture as possible. Whose knowledge and culture is uncertain, because all of this knowledge was lost thanks to, uh, let's say plans going wrong. Horizon Zero Dawn is set in what was the USA before this robot apocalypse, specifically across Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and Montana, with the Frozen Wilds DLC in Wyoming. All of this is important because the history of our world, specifically the history of settler colonialism in the United States, did happen in the world of Horizon Zero Dawn. So humans, ergo human societies, have been born anew, now with living machines as part of the ecosystem. We don't know what the rest of the world looks like post-apocalypse, just this part of the USA. The player encounters four tribes, as the game calls them, named the Nora, Banuk, Osaram, and Karja. Our protagonist, Aloy, starts as an outcast of the Nora tribe, becoming a Nora Brave, or warrior, after being allowed to participate in a trial known as the Proving. She then ends up on a quest to save the world, which would take far too long to explain and isn't really needed for now. The first settler move to innocence that Tuck and Yang describe in Decolonization is Not a Metaphor is what they term settler nativism. In their words, in this move to innocence, settlers locate or invent a long-lost ancestor who is rumored to have had Indian blood, and they use this claim to mark themselves as blameless in the attempted eradications of indigenous peoples. A fictional example of this would be the character Daryl Whitefeather from the Netflix series Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. So Daryl Whitefeather, mm. that's a really interesting name. Well, I'm what they call a full one-eighth. One eighth Chippewa. Oh. Those are my people. A real life example would be US Senator Elizabeth Warren. President Trump, who calls her Pocahontas, has suggested he would pay a million dollars to a charity if she took a DNA test to prove her heritage. Tonight, she says 
it's time to pay up. Still today, the Massachusetts senator who's eyeing a 2020 White House run took up the president's challenge, releasing this video showing her receiving the results of a DNA test. What do the facts say? The facts suggest that you could absolutely have a Native American ancestor in your pedigree. Okay. Warren was told she had a Native American ancestor in the range of six to ten generations ago. I am not a tribal citizen. Uh, I had a good conversation last week with Chief Baker, who is chief of the Cherokee tribes, and I told Chief Baker uh, that I am sorry that I extended confusion about tribal citizenship and tribal sovereignty. So, so. Um, I really want to underline the point. Tribes and only tribes determine tribal citizenship. It is an issue of tribal sovereignty. Yeah. In Warren's apology, she says, Tribes and only tribes determine tribal citizenship. It is an issue of tribal sovereignty. But then, why did she take the DNA test in the first place? Blood quantum laws in the US have historically defined Native American status by Native American ancestry. But in fact, many Native tribes and nations do not include blood quantum as criteria for tribal membership. Blood quantum is an aspect of race science. And as both Elizabeth Warren and Daryl Whitefeather show, white Americans clearly still have a deep investment in race science. Tuck and Yang explain, In the racialization of whiteness, blood quantum rules are reversed so that white people can stay white yet claim descendants from an Indian grandmother. In 1924, the Virginia legislature passed the Racial Integrity Act, which enforced the one-drop rule except for white people who claimed a distant Indian grandmother, the result of strong lobbying from the aristocratic First Families of Virginia, who all claim to have descended from Pocahontas, including Nancy Reagan, born in 1921. Known as the Pocahontas Exception, this loophole allowed thousands of white people to claim Indian ancestry while actual indigenous people were reclassified as colored and disappeared off the public record. Settler nativism, through the claiming of a long lost ancestor, invests in these specific racializations of indigenous people and black people and disbelieves the sovereign authority of indigenous nations to determine tribal membership. The sovereignty of tribes to decide for themselves who is native rather than settlers deciding that they are native through colonial laws based on race science is especially important when we consider that, frankly, sexual assault was a weapon of war used extensively by colonizers, so many white Americans today are likely to have an ancestor who was indigenous. This ancestry is only invoked to deflect a settler identity while continuing to enjoy settler privilege and occupying stolen land. Video games are a particularly interesting medium when it comes to the question of settler nativism. It's hard to think of a simple example of a video game character that claims Native American ancestry and uses this to alleviate settler guilt and affirm settler claims to the land, though if you can think of any examples we'd be interested to hear in the comments. Gaming is an interactive medium, so the question of white players playing Native American certainly comes to mind, but you don't get many Native American playable protagonists at all, in mainstream games at least. Now what you do get a lot of is fantasy and sci-fi games where characters are coded as indigenous, specifically using Native American imagery. I'm definitely not the first to comment that Horizon Zero Dawn has an issue with cultural appropriation, though I personally think that this is a watered down term which belittles the very colonial violence of stealing and denigrating the cultures of oppressed peoples. The debate was originally sparked by an essay posted on Medium by writer and photographer Dia Lacina. Unfortunately, the original essay, entitled What We Talk About When We Don't Talk About Natives, seems to have been taken down, but Mary Kate Jasper, writing for the Mary Sue, summarizes it as follows. In an essay for Medium, writer and photographer Dia Lucina specifically called out the game's use of four words, tribal, primitive, braves, and savage, and the press coverage that the game received. Not a single review makes a mention of the historical usage of those words, she wrote, or the tropes reflected in Horizon that caused the writers to use them without hesitancy. Lucina continued, 
Writers praised the game's unique and refreshing take on gender, social politics, matriarchies. Nearly every aspect of Horizon's world building has been critically praised using terms that explicitly and historically have applied to indigenous peoples often to disparage our ways of life and oppress us, all while ignoring that unique and refreshing world building has been lifted almost entirely from our cultures. In response to this criticism, Horizon Zero Dawn narrative designer John Gonzalez said, The vocabulary was certainly discussed during the creative process in terms of wanting to make sure we were sensitive to the cultural concerns of our audience. We weren't looking for inspiration from one particular group, and we cast the net widely to look at cultures, tribal cultures around the world and also throughout history. That's why a lot of people talk about the Nora as being like Vikings, or why there are visual elements reminiscent of Celtic pictographs. So inspiration came from a lot of different places. Talking about the term brave, with that in particular, our research into it was that it was not a term that would seem to be offensive. We were trying to find a term that would combine the capabilities of a warrior and the capabilities of a hunter. It was a term that we felt was not derogatory, as we came across some terms that were definitely slurs against Native Americans and other groups throughout history. And so, our decision was based on brave not being a hot-button term. That said, with the kind of culture of the internet that we have right now, it's impossible to predict what it is that may offend. Certainly, we were not intentionally being insensitive, or to offend in any manner. So, there's a few things to unpack here, but essentially the response has completely missed the point of Lucina's criticism and has revealed extremely suspect practices by the studio. First, the claim that inspiration came from a lot of different places, specifically citing the Vikings, is an extraordinary deflection. The Vikings were not, and importantly, are not an oppressed people under settler colonialism. So the equivocation of so-called tribal influences as all being fair game shows an astonishing lack of understanding of historical and present-day systems of oppression. In the second paragraph, references to the studio's research does not cite any research that involved or directly consulted Native Americans, made even clearer by the assertion that they, guerrilla games, felt that it was not a derogatory term. In other words, their cultural research practice was not to directly consult native communities, but to make their own decisions and judgments with no consideration for their own privileged positionality. Finally, the real mask-off moment comes, of course, with the dismissal of valid concerns from natives about how they are portrayed or metaphorized in the media, something which directly contributes to the violence towards natives, as nothing but an expression of an imagined, overly sensitive snowflake internet culture. Guerrilla games clearly don't see Native Americans as real people, and the game reflects this. As some have pointed out and praised, there is, according to our understanding of race, a huge amount of racial diversity in Horizon Zero Dawn. However, as Josh Griffiths points out in his video on Horizon Zero Dawn's Native American influences, despite the fact that people from all over the globe were signed onto the Zero Dawn project, apparently Native Americans weren't among them. Native Americans, as real people, are vanished, but indigeneity becomes metaphorized. What do I mean when I say that indigeneity is metaphorized? As we mentioned earlier, racism operates on the basis of racialization. In the world of Horizon Zero Dawn, as the blog Race and Horizon Zero Dawn by Siggy discusses, race, as we know it, doesn't exist. There is no race science in this world. The Nora, Banuk, Karja, and Osaram are more aptly described as ethnic groups. They share culture, clothing, traditions, and so on. Though everybody seems to speak English, which is certainly interesting, though it never seems to be addressed. There is discrimination, and there are certainly power dynamics between these ethnic groups, but this isn't on the basis of race science. Biological essentialism is meaningless to the construction of these ethnic groups. You could argue that even if biological race doesn't exist, in some form the process of racialization exists in the world of Horizon Zero Dawn. After all, in our world, even though race is premised on biology, think about the way we see race in practice. Colloquially, we often act as though race, ethnicity, and nationality are all the same, 
and we often racialize people based on what are actually, more accurately, ethnic or even religious traits. For example, while many people of different ethnicities are Muslim and may wear hijab, those who wear hijab are often racialized as Arab. A white European woman may walk down the street in a hijab and people will often assume she is Arab because she is visibly Muslim and some Arabs have pale skin. Even this is based on the assumption that all Arabs are Muslims or all Muslims are Arab, both of which are incredibly false. In any case, this can be considered an example of racialization. In the world of Horizon Zero Dawn, then, one might say that people racialize one another on the basis of ethnic traits. Clothing is a strong one, as there are distinct colours and styles which the four tribes wear, though this doesn't hold water when it comes to our protagonist, apparently. For some reason, no matter what outfit you wear in the game, people just see her and know that she's Nora. This would imply that racialization based on biological essentialism is a thing, but there is no other evidence for it in the game. If racialization is designed to categorize people in order to oppress them, the Karja have certainly used this sort of racialization based on ethnic traits to commit violence against other tribes. They are the closest thing to an oppressing, even colonial power in this world, or at the very least a previously colonial power which is apparently trying to make amends, though their bigoted attitudes hold still for many individuals you encounter in the game. As Siggy puts it, the Karja are strongly coded as a colonial power. They're the ones with the technology, the cities, and the power to subjugate neighbours. If the Karja had the power, they would certainly want to convert the Nora to their enlightened, sun-worshipping religion. Indeed, the Karja seem to have waged war on all three other tribes in an attempt to conquer them, and their sun-obsessed narrative has a lot in common with the enlightening narratives of European colonisers. The Karja religion arguably also bears visual and structural similarities to Catholicism, ruled by a masculine priesthood. The Karja consistently call Aloy a savage or a barbarian, and they think the same of the Banuk, even looking down on the Asaram. The relationship between the Karja and the Asaram is particularly interesting, actually. While the Karja see the Nora and the Banuk as savages because they are clearly native coded peoples, the Asaram are visually and culturally coded more as medieval Europeans, or a romanticised fantasy world version of them anyway. The Karja, however, live in a desert city and are strongly coded as a mishmash of Arab and East Asian, with a liberal dose of Catholicism on top. If they are a colonial power, their visual coding and rhetorical coding, particularly with its focus on the sun, probably invoke Japanese or even Islamic imperialism, arguably more than European imperialism. After all, they look down on the European coded Asaram, who also look down on the Nora and the Banuk. It's it's honestly a mess. So you, the player, are Aloy, a Nora, and in this world, the Nora are native coded. They experience a fantasy world version of anti-indigenous racism, which is recalled through the use of terms like savage and barbarian, as well as the Karja's recent historical attempts to civilize and massacre the Nora. But of course, as I've been implying with my discussion of coding, fantasy worlds don't exist in a vacuum. They're created in the context of our world and the long history of images and meanings that our world contains. So it means something that Aloy is white. While skin colour isn't an aspect of racialization in Horizon Zero Dawn, it is in our world. Even if she wasn't white, it means something that she's non-native. As such, you, the player, get to have your cake and eat it too. You're white and you're native. You can claim to understand anti-indigenous racism. You can perform sympathy while alleviating settler guilt. The experience of Native Americans under settler colonialism is reduced to a cool world-building device in a fantasy game, erasing and trivialising the real and continued oppression the natives face. Indigeneity is metaphorised for your comfort and your benefit. Your claim to the land as you hunt machines with your bow and spear is reaffirmed. In a way, it operates like settler nativism. It's kind of like saying you have a Native American ancestor. While it's important to say that this is true of every scenario where Aloy is non-native, her whiteness is important here. This is because, as both Sibby in their aforementioned blog and Holly Green for Paste point out, it allows her, and the player, to occupy a position of white saviorism, 
This has been observed in relation to the Frozen Wilds DLC, where Aloy is the answer to the Banuk's problems, the hero they've been waiting for because they're too backwards to save themselves. I certainly agree with this argument, but I'd actually argue it's true of the whole game. The entire game pushes the idea that Aloy is not like other Nora. What? A Nora? Wearing one of these? That's impossible. Your tribe fears the old places, forbids them. Who says I'm like other Nora? If the Banuk foolishly worship the blue light and see AI as spirits, the Nora foolishly shun the ruins of the old world thinking everything to do with technology is evil. It is Aloy, her name literally taken from alloy, meaning a mixture of metals with one or more elements, who knows better than all of them. You are different from the Banuk. Even her own dialogue often betrays contempt for the Nora, seeing their beliefs and way of life as foolish. Sure, she has some justification, what with the whole, like, outcast thing, but still kind of sucks. Some part of her, in some way, does think she's better than them, even when she denies it. While her people bickered, she was the one who took responsibility. The only one who could. She was better than them. That's not what I said. None of this is to say that the Nora or Banuk are perfect, but the attitudes that the game, Aloy as a character, and those in the world around her have of them is that they are a backwards people. Aloy finds more in common with more enlightened folk, like the Osiram Erend or the Sun King Avad. And even though neither of these tribes are depicted as perfect either, they are depicted as clearly superior. And Aloy, a Nora who is not Nora, just as the player is native but not native, is the most superior of all. She is the mythical American, as Tuck and Yang would say. Beyond Two Souls. Where do we even begin with Beyond Two Souls? Of all the video games that could possibly have Elliot Page in it, this is the game? Okay, okay. Thankfully, this video has to be focused or I'd be here all day. But it feels important to note first that Quantic Dream, the studio behind Beyond Two Souls, has a reputation for racist, sexist workplace culture, and Quantic Dream founder David Cage, in particular, is reportedly a nightmare. This doesn't come as a huge surprise, at least not to me, certainly not to some others who have played these games. Quantic Dream's other titles include The Nomad Soul, Fahrenheit, or its alternative title Indigo Prophecy, Heavy Rain, and Detroit Become Human. With the exception of Nomad Soul, I have played or watched all of these games. And while Quantic Dream has been praised for its influence on narrative, cinematic, and choice-driven game design, though even these qualities are debatable, these games, without fail, feature everything from extremely clunky racism allegories, to gratuitous objectifying shots of women, to overwhelming trauma porn. Suffice to say that Quantic Dream are racist and sexist in both their workplace practices and in the games that they make. This is the context, then, in which Beyond Two Souls exists. Released in 2013, Beyond Two Souls tells the story of Jodie Holmes, played by Elliot Page, a girl with extremely OP powers thanks to her supernatural link with an entity named Aiden. And no, I've never heard anyone pronounce it like that either. In a nutshell, Jodie is taken from her bio-mother at birth. Her foster parents give her over to some scientists who raise her. The scientists give her over to the CIA, she runs away from the CIA, and finally she returns to the CIA when her scientist father figure Nathan, played by Willem Dafoe, tries to bring the human world and the spirit world together in order to see his dead wife and child again. All of this in non-chronological order. While we could certainly talk about all the wacky hijinks Jody and company get up to in Somalia, Saudi Arabia, and the Republic of Kazirstan, China, it's basically China, we're going to focus on the good old US of A, because, of course, in this video, we're focusing on settler colonialism. 
Tuck and Yang's second settler move to innocence is called The Settler Adoption Fantasy. Discussing the 1990 film Dances with Wolves, Sarah Ahmed, as quoted by Tuck and Yang, says, The white man in this example is able to become without becoming. He alone is transformed through his encounter with the Sioux, while they remain the mechanism for his transformation. He becomes the authentic knower, while they remain what is to be known and consumed, and spit out again, as good Indians who confirm the white man's position as hero of the story. The Sioux remain objects, while Kevin Costner is able to go anywhere and be anything. In Beyond Two Souls, when Jody is on the run from the CIA, she encounters a Navajo family. The Navajo Nation occupies parts of the states now known as Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico. The family feed Jody and give her a place to stay for a few nights, but something mysterious is afoot. Before going to bed each night, Jody is told to board the windows and to stay in her room, advice which she, of course, completely ignores. Thanks to her supernatural powers and her supernatural buddy Aiden, Jody is able to figure out that the land is cursed, and she also learns why. After Jody finds a series of talismans, Shimasani, the grandmother of the family who hasn't spoken to anyone for years before now, breaks her silence by speaking to Jody. Turns out, the family's ancestors summoned a spirit called Yeitso to take revenge on the white colonizers who were, you know, stealing their land, killing their people, and destroying their way of life, but the spirit turned against them. With Jody's leadership and knowledge of the spirit world, the family are able to lift the curse, but not without the deaths of Shimasani and the family patriarch Paul. In the aftermath, the sons Corey and Jay take Jody to a sacred burial ground where, and I quote, no white man has ever been. Jody discovers cave drawings that show a human entity connected to a spiritual entity by an umbilical cord, just like she is connected to Aiden. Before she leaves, she can either hug or smooch Jay, a potential love interest, after he tells her that she will always have a home with them. Indeed, one of the game's possible epilogues, depending on player choice, is one where Jody decides to spend the rest of her life with Jay and Corey. One of the decisions which is imperative to this is the final choice, between life and the beyond. Here, in the beyond, the game chooses to show us Paul and Shimasani, comparing them to the wind and the stars and the universe, while life shows Jody's white CIA love interest, Ryan, very much alive. Beyond Two Souls doesn't exactly have the most subtle writing, so the messages here are pretty on the nose. White colonizers aren't at fault, it's the Native Americans who destroyed themselves by turning to revenge. Thanks to their curse, they are a people dying out, a people that quite literally represent death. The curse is a response to death, it causes death, and Paul and Shimasani are emblematic of death. Jody, the family's white saviour, is able to break the curse, because for some reason Shimasani has decided not to talk to her own family for many, many years, but is happy to tell her secrets to some random white woman. Jody is adopted into the family through the course of the episode, where you act like a member of the group, working on the farm, eating food together, and sleeping in their home. And of course, the game can end with her long-term adoption into the family, if she chooses to spend her life with Jay. In Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, Tuck and Yang say that they're not interested in the legitimacy of white people's adoption into native tribes as much as the primacy of this trope in culture. On rare occasions, some adoptions like this have indeed occurred, from John Smith in 1607, as popularised by the Disney film Pocahontas, to, more recently, Johnny Depp, but they really haven't been as common as you might think based on popular culture. Why the fixation on this trope? According to Tuck and Yang, this narrative spins a fantasy that an individual settler can become innocent, indeed heroic and indigenized, against a backdrop of national guilt. The adoption fantasy is the mythical trump card desired by critical settlers who feel remorse about settler colonialism, one that absolves them from the inheritance of settler crimes and bequeaths a new inheritance of nativeness and claims to land, which is a reaffirmation of what the settler project has been all along. Settler fantasies of adoption alleviate the anxiety of settler unbelonging. He adopts the love of land and therefore thinks he belongs to the land. His cultural hybridity is what makes him more fit to survive. 
the ultimate social Darwinism. Better than both British and Indian, he is the mythical American. Jody is the good white woman. She is native, but she is not native. She's better. The mythical American. Similar to Aloy, as I argued earlier. She understands things the Navajo family don't understand, she has access to knowledge that they don't. While she is sympathetic to them, she is ultimately better than them, and this legitimizes her settler claim to the land. The vanishing native trope that this episode perpetuates with the death of Shimasani and Paul, and with their metaphorical significance at the end of the game, is particularly important. So is the fact that Jodi is a sympathetic character, or at least, the game attempts to make her sympathetic by piling on generous amounts of trauma, but little to no actual character traits or development. Because that's how David Cage thinks writing works, I guess. According to Tuck and Yang, Performing suffering is also critical for the settler. Sympathy and suffering are the tokens used to absorb the native other's difference, coded as pain. Because the vanishing native is imagined as brooding, vengeful, protecting a dying way of life, and unsuccessful in finding a mate and producing offspring. And Jody is, of course, the player-controlled protagonist. The evidently white target audience has their innocence, superiority, and claim to the land affirmed by performing Jody's suffering and performing sympathy with Native Americans. If the player doesn't choose Jay as a romantic interest, the end of the family line seems assured, as he and his brother are the only Navajo left. An interesting narrative choice, considering that in reality, according to the Navajo Times, as of 2021 the Navajo Nation has 399,494 members, the largest federally recognized tribe in the US. If the player does choose Jay as a romantic interest, there is, of course, the possibility that he and Jody would have children. But remember when we talked about blood quantum earlier? Tuck and Yang further explain, Native American is a racialization that portrays contemporary indigenous generations to be less authentic, less indigenous than every prior generation, in order to ultimately phase out indigenous claims to land and usher in settler claims to property. This is primarily done through blood quantum registries and policies which were forced on indigenous nations and communities, and in some cases, have overshadowed former ways of determining tribal membership. This entire narrative in Beyond Two Souls places questionable emphasis on the nuclear family and heterosexual reproduction, so it isn't much of a leap to say that the framing of the game would frame Jody and Jay's child as less native, more settler. The conclusion of the sequence, and of the game, is, as Tuck and Yang put it, now we are all Indian, and decolonization is no longer an issue. Our only recourse is to move forward, however regretfully, with our settler future. If you're looking for a series that is defined by its use of colonization and empire, look no further than Star Wars. The Star Wars franchise, whilst predominantly being known for its film and TV installments, also spans across books, comics, and video games. Of course, as we're a video game channel, we're going to be using one of the many Star Wars games as a case study for colonial equivocation, Tuck and Yang's third settler move to innocence. That game is 2003's Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, or KOTOR for short. KOTOR is an RPG set 4,000 years before the fall of the Republic and the rise of the Galactic Empire, and follows the story of an amnesiac Jedi Padawan named Revan. Revan, with the player controlling, must learn Jedi powers and choose either the light side or the dark side along their way. The story takes the player to various locations in the galaxy, including two colonized planets, Tatooine and Kashyyyk. Interestingly, KOTOR was one of the many Star Wars Expanded Universe titles written out of canon when Disney acquired Lucasfilm in 2012. It's said this was because George Lucas considered EU texts to be an alternate universe to the main timeline of the franchise, but I bet Disney were happy to toss it out of the canon when they saw how much colonialism and slavery appeared in KOTOR. Not exactly a good look for the happiest corporation on Earth. The native species of Kashyyyk and Tatooine, as well as literally being native to their planets, are heavily indigenous coded based on the colonial construction of indigenous human cultures, 
Wookiees are seen as aggressive and animalistic due to their large stature and furry coat, paired with the harmful imagining of native peoples as savage. Their society is organised into tribes and clans, and they have a spiritual and symbiotic relationship with the native Kashyyyk flora. The existence of the Wookiees on Kashyyyk was ignored by the Zerka Corporation, who claimed to discover the planet in 4020 BBY and renamed it Edian. The Zerka Corporation used the Wookiees' fiery temper to justify enslaving them. Wookiees were not warlike. When peaceful, they had the reputation of being gentle and benevolent. However, their tempers were fiery, and an infuriated Wookiee could erupt in a fit of berserker rage that only ceased when the source of their anger was damaged to their satisfaction. While the Wookiees share similarities with Native American tribes, especially with their ties to the flora of Kashyyyk mirroring mystical Native American narratives, the Jawas and the Tusken Raiders of Tatooine are coded more specifically like indigenous Arabs. The Tuscans in particular fit this mould as nomadic, desert-dwelling people, with modest clothing covering their entire bodies and a history of oral tradition. The Tuscans are often called sand people by the other settlers of Tatooine, and are often hostile towards other species. The Jawa, on the other hand, are more accepting of the settlers, and use every opportunity to trade with them. The Tuscans and the Jawa are both said to be evolutions of the Kamumga, a race that inhabited Tatooine in the past when the planet was more than just a desert. The colonial actions of the Circle Corporation on Kashyyyk are pretty cut and dry. However, the settler-colonial relationship on Tatooine between Zerka, the Tusken Raiders, the Jawas, the other settlers, and the Republic is a little more complex. That is a relationship of colonial equivocation. Tuck and Yang define colonial equivocation as the homogenizing of various experiences of oppression as colonization. While a lot of different forms of oppression are connected in some way to colonialism, and it's important to understand that, directly describing different experiences of oppression as colonization simply isn't entirely true or accurate, it's reductive. For example, a white queer person could reasonably say that queer phobia is connected to colonization, but they could not reasonably say that as a white queer person, they are colonized. Even non-natives, while experiencing various forms of displacement and violence from colonization, need to be more thoughtful about whether and in what context they describe themselves as colonized, because as we discussed in our key concepts, not all forms of colonization or racism are the same. If you aren't discussing anti-indigenous racism, if you aren't discussing settler colonialism, if you aren't talking about indigenous sovereignty and repatriation, you simply aren't talking about decolonizing, at least not in its fullest sense. In particular, describing all struggles against imperialism as decolonizing creates a convenient ambiguity between decolonization and social justice work, especially among people of color, queer people, and other groups minoritized by the settler nation state. Although the allegory does not map perfectly given the intergalactic setting of KOTOR, the relationships between the various races found on Tatooine can be described in a similar way. Star Wars has shown us repeatedly that the coexistence of different species of sentient life does not mean that all species were created equal. The Taris city world level at the beginning of KOTOR in particular highlights aspects of humanocentrism and the presence of anti-alien feelings. Tatooine appears in many Star Wars products and is frankly always under oppression from one force or another, be that the Empire, the Republic, or the Zerka Corporation. Tatooine is home to dozens of species, many of whom are there to work for Zerka. The only native species to Tatooine are the Jawa and the Tusken Raiders. Tuck and Yang say, We are all colonized may be a true statement, but is deceptively embracive and vague. Its inference? None of us are settlers. The people of Tatooine, in particular the non-human inhabitants, can certainly claim that they are colonized or oppressed, given the evident humanocentrism of the galaxy at this point, but that does not absolve them of enacting settler colonial violence, and essentially taking on the role of the brown settler. The Zerka Corporation's control of Tatooine is comparable to the coal mining towns of West Virginia and Kentucky in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Zerka, like real-life mining corporations, owned the towns, and the inhabitants relied on them not only for employment, but for infrastructure, goods, and services. This form of worker suppression led to the formation of labor unions in the US. Despite these claims of solidarity, the people of Tatooine show annoyance at, and even hatred of, the native Tusken Raiders and Jawa across the Star Wars franchise. In KOTOR, 
Revan is paid by the administrator of Anchorhead to slaughter a group of Tuscans who have been intercepting shipments. Luckily, the player is able to come to a non-violent solution, but the anti-indigenous sentiment of the settlers of Tatooine is made clear. The inhabitants of Tatooine buy into the settler colonial narrative that their real enemies are the indigenous people, unable to understand that their violent actions are acts of rebellion against the colonizers. If you've been on gaming Twitter at all in the last six months or so, you will have heard of Genshin Impact. Genshin is a free-to-play MMORPG with gacha mechanics that has exploded in popularity worldwide. The game takes place in the world of Teyvat, a continent split into seven nations that are each ruled by an elemental god, or Archon. You play as the Traveller, a being from another world who is searching for their sibling after they were separated by a mysterious god. You make your way across Teyvat, visiting the seven nations and learning about elemental powers along the way. As the game's plot progresses through regular updates rather than being fully available from release, we have currently only visited two of the seven nations, Mondstadt and Liyue. Chinese developers Mihoyo have insisted that the world of Teyvat is entirely fictional, but it is clear that certain areas of the world draw inspiration from real-world cultures. Mondstadt's architecture is heavily based on medieval Germany and Switzerland, with Mondstadt translating to Moon City in German. And Liyue is heavily influenced by China. Liyue is a near homophone of establishing a contract, reflecting its title as the City of Contracts. These similarities to our world have led to many fans questioning elements of the game and its characters. For example, out of all of the playable characters currently available, only two of them are dark-skinned. These characters, Kaya and Xinyan, are hardly stellar cases for POC representation. As I'll go into a bit later, Light-skinned Asian people are not constructed as racial others in China like they are in the UK and the US. This means that Xinyan and Kaya are specifically racialized as other to the Chinese norm in this context. Kaya is described as dressing exotically and is suggested to be a spy from another nation. Xinyan is described as scary and as of the 1.6 update, she's the only playable character that the Traveller has not interacted with in a story mission. Players of Colour picked up on this and began to tweak criticism of the mistreatment of dark-skinned characters in the game. This also led players to interrogate the depictions of the main antagonists of the game, the Hilly Churls. Like most open-world RPGs, Genshin Impact uses generic overworld enemies in daily quests and artifact domains as tools for the player to develop their skills and gather resources. These enemies are the Hilly Churls, and they are heavily coded and racialized as indigenous people. They are described as primitive and tribal, they wear loincloths and painted masks, they have dark skin, and they are frequently seen dancing around campfires. It is suggested that they have been in Teyvat since long before the Archons established the existing national borders. Hilichel Cultural Customs notes that, Hilichels do seem to have an inexplicable affinity for remnants of the past, evidenced by the fact that ruins are one of their preferred locations to camp but investigations thus far have turned up nothing which might hint at the true nature of their connection with the lost civilizations to which these ruins belong. It is highly likely that the Hilly Charles are the indigenous people of Teyvat, and were displaced from their land at some point in the recent past. The indigenous inspirations for the Hilly Charles are undeniable based on a clip from the 2020 Mihoyo Studio Tour that showed an animation artist using an indigenous ceremonial dance video as a reference. This, and the earlier points about Xinyan and Kaya, led to hashtag Boycott Genshin trending on Twitter, with players calling for fans to stop spending money on the game and urging them to write to the developers asking for change. The shortcomings of Mihoyo and Genshin Impact could be a whole video in itself, but today we'll be focusing on the relationship between the Hilly Charles and the Musk family, an academic dynasty from Mondstadt who specialise in Hilichurlian language and culture. We'll see how this family uses conscientization as a settler move to innocence, justifying their mistreatment of the Hilly Charles in the name of progressing academia. According to Tuck and Yang, another settler move to innocence is to focus on decolonizing the mind, or the cultivation of critical consciousness, as if it were the sole activity of decolonization, to allow conscientization to stand in for the more uncomfortable task of relinquishing stolen land. This essentially means that settlers will often look to relieve their guilt about colonization and distance themselves from the bad settlers 
by becoming aware of indigenous issues and decolonial theory through books, articles, podcasts, etc. Whilst decolonizing the mind is important, it is useless on its own. The end goal of gaining political consciousness should be for settlers to be prepared to relinquish their power and land, and to support land repatriation for indigenous people. We don't intend to discourage those who have dedicated careers and lives to teaching themselves and others to be critically conscious. We are asking them slash you to consider how the pursuit of critical consciousness, the pursuit of social justice through a critical enlightenment, can also be settler moves to innocence. Diversions, distractions, which relieve the settler of feelings of guilt or responsibility, and conceal the need to give up land or power or privilege. The Musk family of Tevat's city of Mondstadt are widely known for their study of Hillichalian customs, and use this to distance themselves from the other settlers of Tevat, claiming to have more compassion for the Hillichals through their studies. The family member that the Traveller interacts with most is Elon Musk, I mean Ella Musk, a young girl who claims to be a scholar of Hillichalian linguistics. She features in two daily commission quests asking the Traveller for help communicating with the Hillichal. When the Traveller suggests using violence, she says, Wait, no, my word, just who exactly taught you to go bashing hilly shells around like that? But if the player fails to approach the hilly shells stealthily enough and ends up killing the entire camp, her response is simply, ugh, there's no more hilly shells left at this camp. Such a great opportunity, completely wasted. All I can do now is wait until next time. She cares about hilly shells just as little as everyone else in Tevat, but uses her academic pursuits to relieve herself of settler guilt and hold on to the privilege her family has gained from Hillichellian colonisation. Although Ella Musk is the member of the Musk family that we interact with most in the game, many of Genshin Impact's in-game texts were written by other Musks. This includes Hillichell cultural customs, which are referenced before, and Hillichell ballad selection. These texts tell us a lot about the way the people of Tevat view the Hillichells and how they distance themselves from their culture. It's important to note that the cultivation of a critical consciousness can only go so far when there are no own voices texts available to be studied, and the settlers who produce the text show complete disdain for the people they study, and exploit them for their own means. The preface to Jacob Musk's Hillichell Ballad selection highlights the difference between developing a critical consciousness to aid in decolonization, and doing it to gain clout and moral standing above your settler peers. A collection of Hillichell poetry compiled by the monster ecologist Jacob Musk. During the writing of this book, Musk travelled across the continent to visit every Hillichell tribe, even going so far as to venture deep into Hillichell settlements and become intimately acquainted with their lives. Musk was praised as the poet laureate of Hillichellian for this book, but it is evident that neither the scholar himself nor the Hillichells were particularly fond of this honour. Jacob Musk, though enthusiastic about Hillichell studies, loathed to be associated with them even in his late years. When you consider Musk's feelings towards the Hillichells, coupled with his descriptions of Hillichellian society in his texts, it's unsurprising that the people of Mondstadt's minds are far from decolonized, and no repatriation efforts have been made. Quite the opposite, the scholarship of the Musk family is actively exploitative and is complicit in the violence against Hillichells. We're shown from the very beginning of Genshin Impact that the Hillichells are the enemy, they are inherently bad, a nuisance to society, and seemingly universally hated. But why is it that the citizens of Mondstadt and Liwei hate the Hilly Chels so much, and how does the game signal to the player that they should feel the same? In their essay, Tuck and Yang talk about the concept of settler sovereignty, the idea that for settlers to make a home in the colonised land, they must have sovereignty over everything in the domain. This includes the relationships between particular peoples, lands, the natural world, and civilization. This results in settlers not only imposing rules on who owns what, I own this land and it's legal for you to be here, but on which ways of living are correct. Tuck and Yang state that, in North America and other settings, settler sovereignty imposes sexuality, legality, raciality, language, religion, and property in specific ways. We can see this, for example, in the oppression of Native American people who do not adhere to the sexual binary, and the outlawing of indigenous languages for decades in Australia and New Zealand. The settlers of Mondstadt and Liwei, and presumably the other five nations, exercise their sovereignty by positioning themselves as good and right, and anyone or anything else as bad and wrong. The people of Teva are almost entirely racialized as white, so the dark skin of the Hillichells makes them wrong. 
The people of Teyvat seemingly all speak and understand the same language, so the hilly child's use of their native tongue makes them wrong. The seven archons are worshipped throughout Teyvat in their respective cities, so the hilly child's worship of the raw elements rather than these gods makes them wrong. I could go on. When put like this, you might be thinking, hey, doesn't the Traveller have a lot in common with the hilly child's when it comes to not following the customs of Teyvat? You would be right to think this. The Traveller is able to use elemental power without the gift of a vision, much like the hilly child's. They camp out in the wilderness, they dress differently, and they don't follow the religion of the Archons, yet they are welcomed wherever they go. This is most likely because both Aether and Lumine are racialized as white, just like the populations of Mondstadt and Liwe. This makes it easier for them to assimilate into the white settler culture across the continent and gain privilege that the hilly Charles could never have. It is here that we must remember that Mihoyo is a Chinese company, and therefore the company and its employees are likely to understand racialization in a different way to those in the West. According to Keitaro Okura's 2021 paper titled There Are No Asians in China, The Racialization of Chinese International Students in the United States, race is commonly understood in China as 1. The paradigm of nationality and blood origin that positions the Chinese against all other foreigners, and 2. The paradigm of ethnicity which contrasts the dominant Han Chinese with the 55 Chinese ethnic minorities. That is to say, Chinese people are not viewed as ethnic minorities or POC in China, like they are in the US and UK. Whilst Genshin Impact is one of the more recent games to invoke settler colonial power fantasies with their enemies, it isn't the only culprit. Games from all sorts of genres fall back on the systematic killing of indigenous people as a game mechanic. It's particularly prevalent in open world RPGs, which is often excused or glossed over due to their high fantasy setting and the need for disposable enemies for grinding purposes. Just like indigenous people in real life are constructed as disposable enemies under settler colonialism. In a fantastic article called Genshin's Heli Chell and Gaming's Colonialist Impulse, Chiro Plus goes into just how normalised these settler colonial behaviours have become in our games. They discuss the effect of lingering colonial stereotypes on the game design, saying, the Hillichell's design inevitably draws upon a shared vocabulary of what we consider other enough to justify attacking. When incorporating human characteristics, however, designers may inadvertently rely upon racist motifs normalised throughout centuries of chauvinism to inspire the player's antagonism. Complaints about this sort of enemy are brushed aside because games have been like this for years. In another thread, someone points out that the Hilly Charles have language, poetry and architecture. They joke, how do I side with the Hilly Charles and overthrow the colonialist Knights of Favonius instead of doing a genocide whenever I go looking for puzzles? While it was reassuring to see that I wasn't the only one disturbed, few people had engaged in either conversation, some only contributing something along the lines of, it's the same as any other game. Even with a $100 million budget, Mihoyo chose to stick with the tried and true method of indigenous coding their enemies. It is on the games industry to break this cycle and start considering the harmful settler colonial power fantasies that they are letting their players live out. If you can come up with an expansive fantasy world and a 10 year plot roadmap for your game, you can make enemy characters without relying on anti-indigenous stereotypes. In this context, the Musks of Mondstadt are directly comparable to Western anthropologists in the real world. They exploit and dehumanise indigenous populations for the sake of academic research, and use this to claim critical consciousness and position themselves away from other settlers without giving up their land and privilege. The work they produce perpetuates the settler colonial narratives that indigenous populations are savage, unintelligent and primitive, giving settlers even more reasons to oppress and steal from native communities. Yes, this is a game assist video, so it's very hard to go without mentioning Don't Nod Entertainment's Life is Strange at least once. Those of you familiar with the game might be thinking, why is LIS in a video about indigenous people? There aren't any Native American characters. Well, my dear viewer, that's kind of the point. Tuck and Yang's fifth settler move to innocence is at risking slash asterisking indigenous peoples. This description is specifically related to the ways in which indigenous peoples are counted, codified, represented, and included slash disincluded by educational researchers and other social science researchers. But it is interesting to see how this behaviour by academics is relevant to mainstream media. 
Tuck and Yang state that indigenous peoples are rendered visible in mainstream educational research in two main ways, as at-risk peoples and as asterisk peoples. The at-risk rendering describes indigenous peoples and communities as on the verge of extinction or already extinct, as discussed a bit in previous sections. As at-risk peoples, indigenous students and families are described as on the verge of extinction, culturally and economically bereft, engaged or soon to be engaged in self-destructive behaviours which can interrupt their school careers and seamless absorption into the economy. On the other hand, asterisking indigenous peoples in research is the practice of reducing comments on indigenous experiences to a footnote beneath the main dataset. And let's be real, who actually reads the footnotes? At the same time, indigenous communities became the asterisk peoples, meaning they are represented by an asterisk in large and crucial datasets, many of which are conducted to inform public policy that impact our slash their lives. Asterisking indigenous experiences paints these communities as already extinct, and shows that the settlers have no intention on taking them into account when shaping the future of their own land. The purpose of at-risking and asterisking in data reporting is to protect the researchers from criticism about their exclusion of native peoples, without them having to actually engage with the results relating to indigenous communities. As we mentioned before, this specifically relates to researchers and academics. But the effects of at-risking and asterisking indigenous peoples in this context can be seen elsewhere, including video games. In Life is Strange, there is Native American symbolism everywhere. The Subanga totem watches over the courtyard outside the dormitory, and Samuel the janitor talks in great detail about spirit animals, despite being white. We find out from Miss Grant that Arcadia Bay, like all of America, used to be native land prior to settlers arriving. Blackwell Academy has a noble heritage, from the Native Americans who founded this land to the pioneers who shared it in peace, not fear and violence. But if there was no violence caused by the settlers, then where are all the natives? These cultural touchstones are co-opted by the non-native main cast, making the lives of indigenous people seem mystical and long gone. Sara already pointed this out in our video essay on disability and gender in Life is Strange. Native American cultures, symbols, and prophecies are reduced to props for a story with a majority white cast, certainly an entirely white main cast. There are no real living, present Native Americans to be seen, reinforcing the racist, anti-indigenous myth that Native Americans are already dead or inevitably dying, and reinforcing the fetishistic, mystical Native American trope. There's also the Hope High Prophecy. In episode 3 in the bathrooms of the Two Whales Diner, you can find a piece of graffiti that reads, The Seventh Sign. The sea and sky will turn black and living things die because of it. This is part of a larger prophecy from the Hopi tribe, a Native American tribe from what is now northeastern Arizona. As we've mentioned before, Geek Remix made a great video detailing the full prophecy and how it could potentially link to the events in Arcadia Bay. The seventh sign's use in Life is Strange is clearly meant to signify the oncoming storm that will destroy all of Arcadia Bay if you choose to sacrifice it in episode 5. In the wider context of the prophecy and the settler colonialism of Arcadia Bay, this suggests that once the town is destroyed, the land can be reclaimed by Mother Nature and the indigenous people of the region. But as we've already discussed, there are no native people in Arcadia Bay. This is a failed attempt at land back, and places the Hopi prophecy, and the indigenous people of Arcadia Bay by extension, firmly in the realm of the metaphorical rather than the literal. Plus, finding the graffiti in the Two Whales Diner is entirely optional. Many players have probably never noticed that it's there. Whether you read it or not has no bearing on the outcome of the story. It is simply another case of indigenous culture being asterisked. It is a footnote at the bottom of episode 3. In 2019, Ubisoft released a remastered edition of Assassin's Creed 3, originally released in 2012. With the Assassin's Creed franchise, we have sort of a Kingdom Hearts situation on our hands, where various spin-offs were released before the official Assassin's Creed 3 came out, but it was actually the fifth rather than the third installment of the franchise. Anyway, Assassin's Creed is easily one of the biggest AAA or blockbuster game franchises in the world, to the point that it has a terrible film starring Magneto, I mean Michael Fassbender, in its name. So, in the lead up to the release of Assassin's Creed 3 in 2012, there was, of course, a lot of anticipation around the game, particularly because it would feature a Native American protagonist. 
As we've mentioned, this really, really isn't common for mainstream games. Rodan Hagedon, also known by his English name Connor, would be Genian Gahaka, or as the tribe is commonly referred to in English, Mohawk. The game would be set during the American Revolutionary War. There was interest, but also trepidation. How would Ubisoft tackle Native American representation, and how would they portray historical events which are so foundational to the myth of America? If you're unfamiliar with the franchise, Assassin's Creed is essentially an alternative universe historical fanfiction, I mean historical fiction, franchise. The first game is set during the Third Crusade in the year 1191, the second and its spin-offs are set in Italy during the 15th and 16th centuries during what is commonly known as the Italian Renaissance. You meet historical figures like Richard the Lionheart and Leonardo da Vinci, and you shape historical events. The player character is usually part of an ancient order which is said to be essentially as old as time, called the Brotherhood of Assassins, whose equally old as time counterparts, the Templar Order, are in eternal struggle. There's this loose philosophical underpinning wherein the assassins believe in and fight for free will or individual freedom, and the Templars fight for order and structure. The narrative framing device for the first five games is that during the present day, technology known as the Animus has been produced which allows those who enter into it to access the memories of their ancestors via their DNA, or what those in-game call genetic memory. An unremarkable player insert character named Desmond frames these games because his ancestors, Altair, Enciro, and Radon Hagedon, were all assassins, and their memories hold knowledge that will guide the present day assassins and Templars to the answers they seek. But in this video, we're not interested in Desmond. We're interested in the story of his Native American ancestor, Radon Hagedon, as well as the game's depiction of the American Revolutionary War. It's worth saying that based on reviews and such online, it does seem like a lot of Native Americans were critically appreciative of the game and of Rodon Gueron as a protagonist specifically. It was pointed out that in most video games, when you see Native Americans, it's in a context like Red Dead Redemption, where you're a white man on the frontier and natives are your nameless, faceless enemies to kill. There was also an appreciation for the effort put into cultural consultation by Ubisoft, though to my knowledge only one representative was hired and no natives were involved directly in game development, including writing or narrative design, which in my opinion leaves something to be desired. And there was praise for the game's significance as far as language revitalization is concerned. That is to say, colonization has devastated many native cultures through various means, including residential schools, which were notorious for their violent punishment of native children who spoke their languages or expressed their culture in any way. It's also important to note that many residential schools only closed down as recently as 1969, to take the example of Kamloops Residential School in British Columbia, Canada, where the bodies of 215 First Nations children were recently found. So it really is no small thing to have put this amount of research and effort into making sure that large segments of the game are spoken entirely in the Genian Gahad language by native voice actors. In any case, such humanization of natives is rare. The effort to have a native protagonist in a video game is certainly rare, and language revitalization is invaluable. So these are all positive facets of the game, even if there is much to critique. In contrast to this positive reception from native audiences, it's also worth noticing the general dislike of this game by non-native, particularly white audiences. Countless reviews and videos call Rodan Hagedon boring, naive, and even annoying, though if you ask me, he's a far more compelling character than fan favourite Ezio Auditore, the bad boy Italian womanizer. It's interesting because, as I'll unpack a little further, there's a lot to be said for how this story still centers white masculinist and individualist perspectives. But clearly even the hint of an anti-colonial story, or at least a story which attempts to decenter settler perspectives, has some folks shaking in their boots. The settler move to innocence we'll be discussing here is the sixth and final one, reoccupation or urban homesteading. This essentially refers to how supposedly progressive movements spearheaded by settlers actually serve as a form of reoccupation, which ultimately serves only settler interests and continues to erase and exploit natives. Tuck and Yang analyzed the example of the Occupy movement, which began with Occupy Wall Street in 2011. 
They argue that the rhetoric of the Occupy movement reveals inherent assumptions about land, including land is property, land is slash belongs to the United States, land should be distributed democratically. The beliefs that land can be owned by people and that occupation is a right reflect a profoundly settling anthropocentric colonial view of the world. Supposedly progressive or left-wing movements spearheaded by settler populations in fact re-inscribe the logic of colonial capitalism and refuse to acknowledge that the land which they want to be equally distributed is not theirs to distribute, it is stolen from natives. Their goals ultimately benefit settlers and perpetuate the oppression of natives. These movements claim to be fighting for liberation, but in fact they are fighting for re-occupation. Occupation is a move towards innocence that hides behind the numerical superiority of the settler nation, the elision of democracy with justice, and the logic that what became property under the 1% rightfully belongs to the other 99%. By contrast, Decolonization eliminates settler property rights and settler sovereignty. It requires the abolition of land as property and upholds the sovereignty of native land and people. Urban homesteading is also invoked as a type of reoccupation. Urban homesteading refers to a host of practices from squatting to urban agriculture and beyond. As an example, Tuck and Yang discuss how Occupy protesters use tents to squat on land in order to reoccupy it. The communities formed in these tent cities often replicated European laws and continued to erase and exclude natives. Occupy protesters were often uncomfortable when natives spoke out about the logic of reoccupation that underpinned their campaigns. In Tug and Yang's words, urban homesteading can also become a form of playing Indian, invoking indigeneity as tradition and claiming Indian-like spirituality while evading indigenous sovereignty and the modern presence of actual urban native peoples. More significant examples are occupiers' claims to land and their imposition of western forms of governance within their tent cities slash colonies. Claiming land for the commons and asserting consensus as the rule of the commons erases existing, prior, and future native land rights, decolonial leadership, and forms of self-government. Assassin's Creed III is a very interesting case study to explore this concept. As mentioned earlier, it's set during the American Revolutionary War. Between 1775 and 1783, this war occurred between the Loyalists, who supported continued British rule in the American colonies, and the Patriots, led by a land-owning class of settlers whose goals could largely be summarised by the slogan, No Taxation Without Representation. That is to say, they didn't believe that they should be taxed by the British unless they had representation in the governance of the colonies. As is probably already evident from this brief summary, the interests of people who were racialized and oppressed, whether Native Americans or enslaved Africans, were of no real interest to the Patriots. After all, settler colonialism and slavery gave them land and power. Now, I didn't go to school in the USA, but this is clearly a very important aspect of American history, and perhaps more importantly, the myth of America as a land of freedom and liberty. A conversation between Reed McCarter and Jordan Rivers for Nightmare Mode discusses Assassin's Creed III and compares how the American Revolution was taught in an American context versus a Canadian context, particularly because developer Ubisoft Montreal is Canadian. There's a lot to be said about how, even if Canadians maybe romanticise the American Revolutionary War less, Canada is still a settler colonial nation itself, which continues to perpetuate systemic violence against its own native population. But in any case, recalling their school education about the American Revolutionary War, Rivas says, The problem with idealizing the revolution as a fight for freedom is that so many men in America wanted to establish a British style of government and do many of the things they criticized the British for. Men like George Washington and Alexander Hamilton proved after the war that they didn't really have a problem with a controlling government. They had a problem with a controlling government not controlled by them. Contrasting this idealization of the Revolutionary War, which is so common across American education and culture, Assassin's Creed III is actually surprisingly critical of the war and of the Patriots. 
My own experience of playing the game was honestly that I'd set the bar on the floor in terms of how it would tackle native representation and how it would depict the Revolutionary War, and I was pleasantly surprised when it wasn't terrible. It was even actively critical at times. This critical attitude is even evident from the E3 cinematic trailer, in which Rodan Hagedon says, I watched them fight and die in the name of freedom. They speak of liberty and justice, but for who? Rodan Hagedon's central motivation as a character is essentially to protect his people, the Genin Gahaka. He only becomes an assassin because he believes this will help him achieve this, and he only aligns with the Patriots because he believes this will help him achieve this also. Specifically, and this is very important, various individuals convince him that aligning himself with the assassins and or the Patriots will save his people from the violence of colonization. Juno, a kind of ancient entity with dubious motives, tells Redenhagen to seek out a man named Achilles and to join the assassins in order to save his people from destruction. As events play out, it becomes evident that Juno's interest is in protecting the sanctuary which the Genian Gahaga village happens to lie upon, not preserving the Genian Gahaga people themselves. Thus, she manipulates Rodenhagen for her own ends. Similarly, Achilles' interest is in the Brotherhood of Assassins, specifically in the goal of murdering Templars. Overall, there seems to be quite a neat overlap between the Templars and the Loyalists, so Achilles tries to convince Rodenhagedon that supporting the Patriots is in the interest of him and his people. Then, of course, the Patriots themselves try to convince Rodenhagedon that aligning with them will aid the Genian Gahaka. Here, for example, Samuel Adams tells Rodenhagedon that if he assists with the Boston Tea Party, a historical event wherein the Patriots destroyed a shipment of tea from the East India Company, this will damage the finances of William Johnson, who wishes to buy the land on which Rodenhagedon's village stands and is willing to murder the Genian Gahaka to get it. Cheer up, Connor, for tonight we are all victors. The Sons of Liberty get to send a message to England, and you rob William Johnson of his financing. Your village will be saved." Ultimately, of course, William Johnson finds other ways to finance this land acquisition, and Sam Adams and the Patriots probably knew that. Ultimately, they manipulated Rodenhagedon's labour for their own ends. Many characters in this game, all of whom are trying to manipulate Rodenhagedon for their own gain, so probably no coincidence here, insist that he is naive, but there are occasions where he expresses his own understanding of the hypocrisy of the Patriots. Here is one, which also illustrates how the colonists construct themselves as an oppressed people whose plight is equal to that of racialized people. Well, it's good to see the people finally taking a stand against injustice says the man who owns a slave. <laughs> Ooh, sorry? I practice what I preach, my friend. She's not a slave, but a freed woman, at least on paper. Men's minds are not so easily turned. It's a tragedy that for all our progress, still we cling to such barbarism. Then speak out against it. We must focus first on defending our rights. When this is done, we'll have the luxury of addressing these other matters. You speak as though your condition is equal to that of the slaves. It is not. Tell that to my neighbor who is compelled to quarter British troops, or to my friend whose store was closed because he displeased the Crown. The people here are no freer than Surrey. You offer excuses instead of solutions. All people should be equal, and not in turns. It's in turns, or not at all. Samuel Adams also reveals that the Patriots will bend the truth in order to obtain their goals. And we need to get to work on our message. Message? We must contact the broadsheets at once. Ensure it's clear to everyone that it was the Loyalists who fired first in Lexington. But no one knows who fired first. Which is exactly why we must spread the news quickly. We'll determine public opinion. This seems dishonest. Perhaps, but so what? People must believe we acted in self-defense, else we've committed treason. But you have. Better to bow and scrape before a tyrant, then? Is that what you suggest? No, of course not. No one should be denied freedom. And yet, to change the truth, it seems a dangerous road to travel. Understand, Connor. This is a war fought not just on the battlefield, but within hearts and minds as well. <laughs> 
There's nothing wrong with a bit of theater, especially if it saves lives. At one point, even William Johnson, an assassination target associated with the Loyalists and the Templars, points out the hypocrisy of the Patriots, though he does do a bang-up job of constructing himself as a white savior instead. Do you think that good King George lies awake at night, hoping that no harm comes to his native subjects? Are that the people of the city care one whit about them? Oh, sure. The colonists are happy to trade when they need food or shelter or a bit of extra padding for their armies. But when the walls of the city constrict, when there's crops that need soil, when there's... when there's no more enemy to fight, we'll see how kind the people are then. The colonists have no quarrel with the Iroquois. Not yet, but they will. It is the way of the world. In time, they'll turn. I... I could have stopped it. I could have saved you all. You speak of salvation, but you were killing them. Aye, because they would not listen. And so, it seems, neither will you. So, it seems pretty clear that the colonists aren't much better than the British colonizers. They construct themselves as colonized, oppressed by colonizing power, when in reality, as settlers, they directly enact colonial violence themselves, and they're perfectly happy to continue to do so after the Revolutionary War when they have their own government. The two-part epilogue reinforces this. In Canada Sedon, Rodan Hakedon's village is found empty, and he has a conversation with a man who criticizes the new American government, explaining that the land has been taken by them. In Evacuation Day, Rodan Hakedon watches celebrations in Boston as the British leave the city, but he also notices that Africans are being sold as slaves on the same dock. Clearly, the injustices of the settler colonial state are virtually the same as before, even, as the stranger in the village implies, getting worse and more insidious. But there is, of course, a lot of nuance around this, including the fact that the forms of colonial violence faced by Native Americans and enslaved Africans are, of course, different, that the game fails to confront in a huge way. Take, for example, this exchange between Achilles and Rodon Hagedon, which provides a fantastically reductive account of racialization. You're also going to need a new name. Your skin is fair enough that you might pass for one with uh, Spanish or Italian blood. Better to be thought a Spaniard than a native. And both are better still than I. As Adrian Shaw points out, the game largely sidesteps direct engagement with race to the extent dealing with it would hinder gameplay, however. For example, when Connor first enters the general store, he's met with more suspicion than his white father, Haytham, was in the earlier part of the game. However, after Samuel Adams teaches Connor to rip down wanted posters, bribe town criers, and get the printing press to change the stories to reduce his notoriety, I'm left feeling that it is odd to assume such acts would in any way diminish Connor's suspiciousness, or the guard's heightened alert at his presence. This is to say, Rodan Hagedon has various features, including his evident dark skin and the way he dresses, which would evidently mean that he would be racialized as native and treated as such in the cities. But the game tries to claim that he is light-skinned, which he simply isn't, though his skin tone does seem to fluctuate sometimes, rendering him lighter when convenient, and Achilles gives him the name Connor so that he can pass as a white man. In all of this, Achilles operates strangely like a white man too, essentially telling Rodan Hagedon to lean into his whiteness in order to blend in, when he obviously has no desire to be anything other than proudly native, and doesn't seem to see himself as white at all even though his father is white. Not to mention that it is never explained how Achilles, a black man, has obtained the property and land that he owns, which, of course, as all land in America is, is stolen from natives. Racialization and power are reduced to a matter of skin tone, and racial oppression is configured as a simple hierarchy, when evidently the power dynamic between Achilles and Rodon Hagedon is testament to the fact that this is not the case. There is much more nuance than that. 
Tuck and Yang argue, as discussed earlier, that people of color, though they experience different forms of racialized and colonial oppression in their own right, can also be settlers, and can also perpetuate settler colonialism. Returning to the epilogue, this conclusion to the game is quite a powerful one, one which feels like a damning critique of the Patriots and the violence and hypocrisy on which the American nation was founded, but it also feels honestly just fatalistic. Kanada Zedon reinforces the vanishing native trope. All notable native characters other than Radon Hageron are dead, and he is a lone survivor. We know that he will have biological children, as Desmond is his descendant, but we also know that Desmond is white. Recalling Beyond Two Souls and our earlier conversations around blood quantum, the fact that genetic memory, DNA, and ancestry are all so central to the Assassin's Creed franchise certainly feels uncomfortable here. It feels as though violence and colonization are inevitable, as though reoccupation is inevitable, especially considering the central premise of the Assassin's Creed franchise is that the Assassin Templar conflict is morally ambiguous, has gone on since the beginning of time, and it may never end, and all of that. The overall ending of Assassin's Creed 3 certainly offers no answers, with Desmond uh, p potentially ending the world? And that never really being explained? If I sound confused, it's because I am. In any case, there are no emancipatory futures here, and no hope for liberation. In The Tyranny of Realism, Adrienne Shaw provides a compelling critique of the game, concluding, The critique of realism here is not on the quality of the research or design, but rather that the focus on realism actually belies the fact that what the game reflects is a particular perspective on history that was assumed to be interesting to anticipated players. The tyranny of realism is that games are focused too much on questions of accuracy, rather than emancipatory possibility. If we can only imagine new ways of viewing what has been, we never get a chance to imagine what might be. As far as historical accuracy is concerned, it is true that many natives across the US chose to side with either the Patriots or the Loyalists, most often the latter, during the American Revolutionary War. It is true that land treaties were broken, villages were displaced or wiped out, but the persistence of the vanishing native trope in media is so damaging precisely because it frames natives as a people of the past, people who are already extinct and have no present, let alone any future. And this simply isn't true. Native Americans are alive, and they are resisting, as they always have been. The Assassin's Creed franchise already engages in historical revisionism, it merely purports to historical accuracy, and claims of historical accuracy, as Shaw points out, can always be questioned. So if we're going to write historical fiction anyway, why not admit it's fiction? Why not make it uplifting, radical, emancipatory? This, among other things, speaks to the creators and to the target audience of Assassin's Creed. An emancipatory story in which Redon Hageron had united his village in the name of their collective liberation and future would not fulfil the masculinist, individualist MO of the Assassin's Creed franchise. Interestingly, when we come to the DLC, Shaw argues, in the downloadable add-on Tyranny of King Washington, as Rudan Hageron is in an alternate world, the player battled alongside his people and still living mother to free the land from a maniacal George Washington. In a game invested in historical detail, this anti-colonial revenge fantasy is simply not an option as the main game. Only in a hyper-fictional add-on can there be a reimagined history where Native Americans could be victorious. Even then, the end result of the story is that things are returned to normal and America stands as it always has. And overall, I would agree with this reading. My disappointment with the DLC, however, is largely contained in this end note, that things are returned to normal and America stands as it always has. The entire premise of the tyranny of King Washington is that we are in an alternate universe, and in this universe, George Washington has gone mad with power and is massacring Native Americans. When I put it like that, surely that doesn't actually sound that far from reality, right? But the game constructs this as a terrible alternate future which must never come to pass. The implication is that if in this timeline Washington is tyrannical, he's not so tyrannical in the other one. Even Redon Hageron insists that the real George Washington would never do such things, 
But the real George Washington did do such things, as the main game unsatisfactorily raises, in fact. The critical note of the main game is completely undermined by this DLC. Let me quote the real words of this not-so-bad George Washington in his 1779 order to General Sullivan demanding the genocide of the Iroquois nation in the so-called Sullivan Expedition. The expedition you are appointed to command is to be directed against the hostile tribe of the Six Nations of Indians, with their associates and adherents. The immediate object are the total destruction and devastation of their settlements, and the capture of as many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. It will be essential to ruin their crops now in the ground and prevent their planting more. I would recommend that some post in the centre of the Indian country should be occupied with all expedition, with a sufficient quantity of provisions whence party should be detached to lay waste all the settlements around, with instructions to do it in the most effectual manner that the country may not merely be overrun but destroyed. But you will not by any means listen to any overture of peace before the total ruin of their settlements is effected. Our future security will be in their inability to injure us and in the terror with which the severity of the chastisement they receive will inspire them. In conclusion, Assassin's Creed III, in its only somewhat critical exploration of the American Revolutionary War, offers interesting opportunities to develop an understanding of the Patriots and their so-called revolution against the British as an example of reoccupation with settlers constructing themselves as colonised and pursuing their own self-interest, rather than genuine liberation or decolonization. However, the game falls short in its reductive analysis of race, racialization, and settler colonialism, its perpetuation of damaging tropes such as the vanishing native stereotype, and in its refusal to imagine emancipatory futures for Native Americans. A native protagonist is appreciated, but perhaps less so one shoved into such a white, individualist, masculinist frame. As we've covered in multiple parts of this essay, especially the section on Assassin's Creed 3, the United States as it exists today was built on land stolen from Native Americans. Settlers in the US are frequent culprits of settler moves to innocence, but most are unwilling to do the repatriation work needed to truly decolonize the land. True decolonization is unsettling and radical, something that isn't exactly appealing to the settlers themselves. Indigenous people across the US have multiple grassroots campaigns that you can support to show your solidarity. Native Americans are not a monolith, and the different tribes in different areas of the states will be looking for different things from their direct action. The main drivers of indigenous organizing are land repatriation and an end to anti-indigenous violence. If you live in the US, Resource Generation has a fantastic list of questions and best practices to consider when working on your interpersonal approach to decolonization. These include asking yourself, what is the history of any land you indirectly slash directly have access to? Who are the native people slash communities where you live or in the land you have access to? And what are the visions and struggles of indigenous people slash tribes in the area you live or have access to land in? To support native land conservation, consider Native Land Conservancy in Mashpee, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and First Light, which connects conservation organizations with Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq communities who seek to expand Wabanaki stewardship of land. You can donate directly to Native Land Conservancy or become a member, and First Light's website has a whole host of resources on decolonization in the settler colonial context, indigenous land loss, its links to conservation efforts, and an archive of native art, music, podcasts, and writing. If you are Christian, Berkeley Carnine and Lisa Minow Bloom recommend taking responsibility for your Christian privilege and the doctrine of discovery, a theological justification for the theft of indigenous land. Challenge the notion that the settler church was divinely ordained within your church community. Start conversations about saints or lauded leaders of faith who were directly responsible for conquest. Learn how your church acquired its land and whose land it was originally. Learn the history of your denomination's relationship to conquest. Consider that within Christian traditions there are built-in practices for atonement and reparations, 
Get creative with your spiritual community about what atonement and reparations might look like. If it is possible, try and connect with the indigenous tribal nation in your area to work on this. The fight to stop the building and use of the Dakota Access Pipeline and other associated pipelines is also continuing, with floating pipeline resistance camp Loe La Vie Camp leading the resistance efforts. These pipelines carry crude oil across the country and have been shown to pollute local water sources. According to Lo et la Vie, the BBP crosses an astounding 700 bodies of water, including Bayou La Fourche, a critical reservoir that supplies the United Homa Nation and 300,000 Louisiana residents with clean, safe drinking water. Listen to and uplift Native American voices, donate to indigenous-run fundraisers, and work within your local community to progress land back across the US. While our main focus in this essay has been on anti-indigenous racism and settler colonialism faced by Native Americans, if you're watching this video, and especially if you've made it this far, you've probably heard about the State of Israel's most recent violence against the Palestinian people. Through displacements in the Jerusalem neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah and through the bombing of Gaza. This recent violence is simply the latest demonstration of a long-standing truth that Israel is a settler colonial state with direct ties to European colonialism, ongoing and historical. The right-leaning media in the West often frames the situation in Israel-Palestine as a conflict in order to obscure this truth, but simply put, Palestinians are an indigenous population whose land and life are being taken and destroyed by a colonizing settler population. The state apparatus of Israel upholds settler power and disenfranchises the indigenous population. Israelis themselves directly squat in Palestinian homes. Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? What are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. I didn't do this. But well, you're you're not you're... It's easy to yell at me, but I didn't do this. Yeah, you are helping. stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it and join the Israeli Defense Force, or IDF, shamelessly stating that their ultimate goal is death to all Arabs. Western nations such as Britain, Canada, and the USA are complicit in Israeli settler colonialism, not only through positive propaganda and cultural links, but through arms sales and various other corporate investments in settler colonial violence. We'll go into depth about the games industry's complicity shortly, but right now I'll briefly outline that the main method of activism that Palestinian civil society has called for since 2005 is known as BDS, or Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions. This calls for coordinated campaigns to boycott Israeli goods and services, divest from Israeli arms and companies, and sanction the Israeli state. Personal boycotts are great, but BDS is most useful when targeted pressure is applied on organizations and governments. You can certainly personally boycott products and tell your friends to spread the word far and wide, but some of the most effective work you can do includes, for example, investigating your workplace's complicity in Israeli settler colonialism and lobbying for divestment, or coordinating people to mass email their political representatives, calling for them to speak up and use their position to call the government to impose sanctions. Humanitarian aid is great as well, but ultimately BDS is the long-term political tactic which Palestinians have directly called for the international community to engage in. To learn more than this brief summary can encapsulate, check out bdsmovement.net for information on which companies to target your boycott campaigns, and decolonizepalestine.com to learn more about the colonization of Palestine, including history and myth-busting of right-wing propaganda directly from Palestinians. As gamers, it is vital that we enact BDS tactics. According to the website BDS List, high-tech accounts for 75% of Israel's industrial exports. Not only must we call out and critique the continued portrayal of settler colonial power fantasies in our games, but we must hold these companies to account on their actions in Israel. The official BDS movement lists boycotting HP, or Hewlett Packard, as one of its major global campaigns. HP is a major manufacturer of laptops, printers, and gaming-specific hardware and peripherals through their HP Omen line. HP Omen is still the official PC sponsor and provider for the Overwatch League. BDS activists are calling for a boycott of HP products and services, 
stating that they are complicit in Israel's occupation, settler colonialism, and apartheid regime. They provide computer hardware to the Israeli army and maintain data centers through their servers for the Israeli police. They provide the Itanium servers to operate the Aviv system, the computerized database of Israel's population and immigration authority. This forms the backbone of Israel's racial segregation and apartheid. In November 2015, HP split into two companies, HP Inc. for consumer hardware like PCs and printers, and Hewlett Packard Enterprise HP-E for business and government services. Both HP branded corporations remain complicit in Israeli apartheid and settler colonialism. An international boycott of HP is likely to make a huge impact on the Israeli occupation. HP has been described as the Polaroid of our times, a reference to huge mobilizations against the use of Polaroid technology by the South African apartheid regime for its racist passbook system. Polaroid's 1977 withdrawal from South Africa marked a turning point in the international effort to end apartheid there. Microsoft also holds huge influence in Israel, and Xbox have played a particularly abhorrent role in the recent attacks on Palestinians. In 2015, general manager of Microsoft Ventures Accelerators, Zach Weisfield, said, We see ourselves as a major industry player in Israel. We hire people, we work with startups, we acquire in Israel, we're an industry player. Imagine the impact it would have if Microsoft used its power to take revenue out of Israel, instead of continuing to fuel the economy of a settler colonial nation-state. In 2020, the Washington Post reported Israeli aerospace industries worked with teenagers to test the IDF's new armored fighting vehicle, and their research resulted in the switch to Xbox controllers as the base design for their vehicle's controls. From teenagers up to pre-military guys, and guys who are after their service, we let each one play with the Carmel simulation and define what kind of skills and what kind of accessories we should use and according to that we developed the whole system. They know exactly the position of those buttons, and they can reach much better performances with that system. The controller is just the interface, the whole idea is to present a sophisticated technology in a way they can deal with. Xbox have made no comment about the use of their technology as a piloting mechanism for a war machine. In fact, this isn't the first time global militaries have used gaming hardware in their weaponry. The same Washington Post article recalls that Xbox controllers were used in 2014 and 2018 by the US Navy and military, and also mentions that the US military have started streaming on Twitch as part of a larger recruitment effort. It's not just the hardware companies that we must scrutinize, but the platforms, gaming news outlets, and content creators as well. These groups may not have direct financial ties to settler colonial governments, but their messaging can have a huge impact on the people who buy from complicit corporations. For example, in May 2021, a statement of solidarity with Palestinians and a link to more information and a fundraiser were posted on IGN's social media accounts. The statement read, Palestinian civilians are currently suffering in great numbers in Jerusalem, Gaza, and West Bank due to the active Israel-Palestine conflict. This statement received a lot of positive support from Palestine solidarity activists in the gaming community, as Israeli settler colonialism is rarely talked about in these spheres. However, IGN retracted their statement and posted a new one a few days later, which said, We have a track record of supporting humanitarian efforts and charities across the globe. In the instance of our recent post regarding how to help civilians in the Israel-Palestinian conflict, our philanthropic instincts to help those in need was not in line with our intent of trying to show support for all people impacted by tragic events. By highlighting only one population, the post mistakenly left the impression that we were politically aligned with one side. That was not our intention, and we sincerely regret the error. As I'm sure we've mentioned before on this channel, by refusing to choose a side in instances of oppression, we are choosing the side of the oppressor. Indecision and neutrality still cause harm. It seems that this was a case of corporate overreach and demonstrated a blatant disregard for the most basic standards of journalistic integrity and editorial independence, according to the letter written and signed by 66 IGN employees who were appalled by the removal of the original post, as well as its neoliberal replacement. IGN's Israel branch published their own statement following the initial post from IGN, stating amazement at the piece and condemning it. They also said, We at IGN Israel support the State of Israel, obviously, and support IDF soldiers who do everything to keep us all in these tough days. Views critical of Israel are being shot down from multiple sources at IGN, maintaining the company's complicity in Israeli apartheid and settler colonialism.
The Game Awards 2020 also platformed former IDF member Gal Gadot to present the Game for Impact Award. Gadot is best known for her role in the DCCU as Wonder Woman, and has faced criticism in the past for her defense of and active role in Israeli settler colonialism. While it is true that all Israeli citizens are conscripted into the IDF, this does not absolve Gadot of her direct involvement in Palestinian genocide. If the 19-year-old owner of At Legit Tay Updates could refuse to join the IDF, so could Wonder Woman. In May 2021, Gadot reaffirmed her views in an Instagram post that centred the suffering of Israeli colonizers despite the much larger losses of Palestinian life. My heart breaks. My country is at war. I worry for my family, my friends. I worry for my people. This is a vicious cycle that has been going on for far too long. Israel deserves to live as a free and safe nation. Our neighbours deserve the same. I pray for the victims and their families. I pray for this unimaginable hostility to end. I pray for our leaders to find the solution so we could live side by side in peace. I pray for better days." This statement is tame compared to some IDF TikToks yelling death to all Arabs, but it still frames the situation in Palestine as a conflict rather than a site of settler colonialism, where the settler oppressors are attacking the oppressed natives. Palestinians killing Israelis in self-defense is incomparable to the systematic acts of genocide against Palestinians by the State of Israel. As a community, it is our duty to call out and organise against these instances of complicity in settler colonialism when we see them, not just in our industry, but across the board. Challenge the use of the word conflict when talking about Israel, engage in BDS activities where you can, and continue to fight for a free Palestine when the mainstream media goes silent once more. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. If you enjoyed it, please do give it a like and be sure to comment. As always, a huge thank you to our patrons who make videos like this possible. We genuinely couldn't do this without you. Special thanks to our ambassador tier patrons, Beatrix Livesey Stevens, Fizzle Fur, and Maxi Maori. And thank you so much to Henry as Human, not only for being a patron, but for taking the time to record footage from Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic for use in this video. If you aren't a patron already, please consider supporting us over at patreon.com slash gameassistyt. Catch us over on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch for further discussions and conversations. And as always, thank you for watching, and take care.